Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lakeville United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Ed. I'm so glad to see you all here with us today. Before we begin, we do have just a few announcements to bring before the congregation. Missions Evangelism Meeting is tomorrow, Monday at 7 p.m. So if you're on Missions and Evangelism, or you have a mission or evangelistic idea, we do invite you to come to our meeting at 7 p.m. Ernestine Mission Circle Meeting is Tuesday at 11 a.m. Bring your own bag lunch out to the pavilion. Ad Council Meeting is Tuesday at 7 p.m. Lakeville United Methodist Church Community Youth Center kickoff party be is May 19th from 6 to 8. So if you know anyone from grades 6 to senior year of high school, invite them to come here this next Sunday from 6 to 8 for our kickoff party. And if you'd like to help, let me know. We can use all the helping hands. That's all the announcements I have. Do you have any announcements to bring before the congregation? Well, if not, then I invite you to rise as you're able in body and spirit for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray for your spirit to be upon us this day. We pray for your spirit to guide us, to lead us in worship. We pray for your spirit to open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to receive your word so we can leave here energized and prepared to follow wherever you may lead us. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to remain standing for our opening hymn, number 352. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord. in the world. 
Uh, please remain standing for the call to worship. Sing to God a new song. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Break into joyful song. Let the seas roar and the floods clap their hands. God is coming to judge the world with equity. Sing to God a new song. You may be seated. At this time, I invite the kids to come forward for our children's message. Oh, I'll explain in a sec. Do your job. How y'all doing? Cool shirt, pineapple flowers. So, do you know what today is? Mother's Day. Yeah. You remember it's Mother's Day. Did you get your mom anything? No, because my dad didn't take me shopping. Your dad didn't take you shopping? So, what are you going to do for your mom instead? Spend time with your mom. Okay. Why do you spend time with your mom? Because it's a special day to celebrate your mother. It's a special day to celebrate your mother. So you spend time with your mom. So, let me understand this right then. To show your love and your appreciation for your mom, because your mom does a lot for you, right? Your mom makes sure you have food. Yes. Your mom makes sure you wake up for school. Yes. Your mom keeps you in line to make sure you don't hurt each other. Yes. Right? <laughs> Very important jobs. <clears throat> you spend time with her to show her love. Okay. So, can you think of anyone else who shows us love? Okay, you don't have to list everyone. Dad, too. Okay. So, Dad, show us love. Grandparents, show us love. God and Jesus, show us love. And since I'm a pastor, I'm going to be talking about God and Jesus, okay? Okay. God shows us love all the time, right? God made everything around us, right? Did you guys see the Northern Lights this last weekend? No? Okay. Yeah, well, if you go online, you can see a lot of really cool pictures, and those were made by God. And God sent Jesus to be with us, right? Yes. And God gives us the Spirit. Yes. So what are some ways we can show God love? By believing in Mm-hmm. Praying. How do we show our mom's love again? Time. Spending time. Yeah. God asks you, if you love me, spend time with me. How do we spend time with God then? Believing in him, praying, coming to church. Um, do we spend time when we are talking to other people about how much God loves you? Yeah. yeah. Um, when you read your Bible, are you spending time with God? Do you spend time with God? Okay, I need to change my talking points because you got those down. So, next week I'm going to change up what I normally say. So, this week and today, as you spend time with your mom and show her how thankful you are and how much you love her, I also want you to think about how we are called to show that same kind of thankfulness and love to God. And we do that by spending time with God, by doing what God says, by saying, God, thanks. So can you do that? I also have a very important job for you today. See all these flowers? They need to be delivered to all the mothers. 
And today is Mother's Day. And you know what I found? Some of the people in my life who've really loved me as a mother weren't always my mom. My mom loves me unconditionally. Want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah. I was a delight as a child. So. <laughs> oh, thanks, Denny. <laughs> but I, I, growing up in the church, also had a lot of moms who would watch over me and care for me. They were my aunts. They were my teachers. We're just going to go with women today. We'll do uncles on Father's Day, okay? Okay. So, they were teachers, Sunday school teachers. The lady down the street who would watch me when I play and say, don't step in front of that truck when I was about ready to step in front of that truck. They all showed me love. So, I'm going to ask all the ladies in church who would like a flower today to commemorate the love you show for these kids and all the kids in your life to raise your hand and they, along with me, and I'm going to um, draft Travis. And Denny said something earlier. So Denny. <laughs> See, I am a delight. <laughs> yeah. Come help us deliver these flowers to the moms in the congregation. Denny? Hey, Denny. Could you just take care of the ladies up here? Okay. Like I said, ladies, if you like a flower, please raise your hand. Okay. Oh, i just been told by Carol, sorry, you all get them. <laughs> Go. Four. <laughs> Betsy, do you have one? Oh, nope, you got. She's got you. one down. Thank you. Carolyn, let me go get some for you ladies. you to follow um, Miss Carol to Sunday school, right? And also, we do have a couple spares. So if you're right now thinking, oh no, I forgot a Mother's Day gift, <laughs> feel free to take one home with you. Thank you, Denny and Travis, for all your help. We lost, we lost Denny. <laughs> At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward, collect our tithes and our offerings.
Lord God, thank you for all that you've given us. And in gratitude, we return these, our first fruits, our tithes, and our offerings. We pray for a blessing be upon these tithes, that they may help us continue to do the missions and ministries you've entrusted to our care. So we can reach out from beyond these walls to go out and share your love with everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we enter in this time of prayer, I do invite you to lift up before God and the for the congregation names for us to pray over this week but also God's sightings, so that we as a church family can celebrate all that the Lord has done for us together. Also, if you're watching from home, we do invite you to post on our Facebook wall or YouTube feed any prayer requests you may have. And if during the week you have a prayer request, I invite you to contact myself or the church office, and we'll put your prayer requests on our prayer board. Do we have an update from Dale Murphy? Dale writes, thank you all for the prayers and cards. Please continue to pray for me as I undergo rehab and more testing this week. We will have results back after the 20th from testing. (coughs) Dale also has given us an updated address, so we'll pass this along and make sure everyone gets to know where Dale is. Yeah, Betsy. Continue prayers for Karen Lind. For Hope Elliot. Continue prayers for Hope Elliot. Yeah. I like to praise God for the mother and daughter banquet with the beautiful help. Praise God for all the help for the mother daughter banquet. For the upcoming wedding of my daughter's future son-in-law this Saturday. For the upcoming wedding of Jennifer. Jennifer, Sorry, I just kicked that (laughs) trash can. Jennifer Jennifer and Andre, Roger Riddle's daughter and future son-in-law, as they have their (laughs) upcoming wedding. Continue prayers for Nancy Gross. Continue prayers for Ben Six. Prayers for my brother Toby Heckman, who was hospitalized this week for heart complications. Prayers for Toby Heckman, who was hospitalized this week for heart complications. Yeah. Continue prayers for Gary. His cancer treatments are not going well. Yeah. Uh, first, our friends, uh, Kim and Will, and then Mickey and Sam. Yeah. Prayers for Pastor Kim Boss, who's helped me preach here before, and her husband, Will. They just had their baby, Sam Asher, and hopefully they'll be able to go home soon. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we come to you this day with the prayers upon our hearts. We come with you wherever you lead us, Lord. Lord, we pray that as we followed you here today, we will follow you forth from here, out into the wider world, out into your creation, serving you with every breath, showing your love to all, not just with hollow words, but with deeds as well. Lord, we pray for our church this day. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for those here with us and those joining from afar. 
Lord, we pray for your healing touch be upon our brothers and sisters, that they are constantly reminded of your love, that they feel your presence, Lord, and that we can be there, a visible sign that they are not forgotten. And Lord, we pray for our missions and ministries. We pray for our new missions and our new ministries you've shared with us. We pray that we can continue, continue, Lord, to reach out and grow your kingdom. And God, we pray for our community. We pray for our families, our friends, for our neighbors. We pray for those who are grieving this day, who are suffering from the loss of health, of normal. We pray you lift them up. We pray you dry their tears. And Lord, we know you are with them every step of the way, and we pray we can be there too. We pray for the teachers, the students, and the faculties of our schools. We pray for those who are going afar. We pray for their safe returns. And we pray, Lord, for your spirit to be upon our community. And Lord, we pray for our nation, our world, and all the world's leaders. We pray for your wisdom be upon our leaders this day. We pray for your justice, your peace, your mercy, and your love to wash over the world. We pray for your kingdom to grow here. And we pray for your children across the globe. And Lord, on this day, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the beautiful weather. We give you thanks for the beauty of creation. Today we also give time to remember thanks for our mothers, for those who raised us, whether they be mothers by blood or mothers by love. And Lord, most of all, we give thanks for your son, Jesus Christ who came to be with us, who died for us, who was raised for us, who defeated the power of sin and death for us. And it's in his name we now pray the prayer he tossed the pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you please stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture? This morning's scripture is taken from Acts 7, verses 54 through 60. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Seated. We're continuing our look at post resurrection Jesus sightings. Here, I have to admit, I'm cheating a little bit. The other post-resurrection sightings have been Jesus appears, walks around, talks with them, and such. This is a little different. Stephen sees Jesus, so I'm going to count it, even if it is just a vision. Because I think there's a lot to learn from the story of Stephen, the first martyr in the church is death. While reading this, I was thinking about how much I love when kids ask me questions. See, adults ask me questions all the time. But it's usually something like, is there anything going on at the church on this day? Or, hey pastor, when's the meeting? And my response to both of those are, go talk to Sherry, I don't know. But when we adults ask each other questions, it's usually more formal, it's more business oriented. Kids don't have any filters. I will ask, are there any questions to kids? And one kid will be like, why do you have a beard? Who's your favorite Power Ranger? The answer to both of those are one, I forgot my razor one time, and two, Billy, the Blue Ranger. But one time, I said, are there any questions? And this third grader looked at me and said, is getting angry a sin? Is getting angry a sin? And I had to stop. And I said, okay, give me a moment to think. And I said, yeah, getting angry is a sin. Jesus preaches about it. Jesus says getting angry is a sin. He says in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, if you ever want to look it up, you've heard what I said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable, held to judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable for judgment. That is, you've committed murder in your heart. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say a f you are a fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Pretty clear cut. Pretty serious and straightforward. Jesus isn't talking metaphors here. There's no parable for us to unpack. There's no, I gotta go back to the ancient Greek and look at what the words mean or anything like that. It's all straightforward. 
I can't say, well, actually, it means. Jesus says, if you get angry, you have committed a sin. It's a pretty clear-cut lesson. And we see that play out here today in Stephen's martyrdom. The religious leaders have heard Stephen's prophetic speech because prophetic because he spoke truth to power. He said what needed to be said, not what they wanted to hear, and they got angry. They raged because they heard the truth. They gnashed their teeth, tore their clothes, plugged their ears. So angry, they murdered the man for it. Jesus said, when you get angry at a brother and sister, you commit murder in your heart. Well, friends, they committed murder, murder. They stoned Stephen. And it's not a fast process. It's a deliberate one. They raged. And that's why sin, anger, is a sin. Rage. Rage isn't something you control. Rage is something that controls you. Rage isn't something you can say, oh, I'm not going to feel that right now. Rage consumes you, burns you, and causes you to lash out and hurt others, hurt the thing that's upsetting you. They raged at Stephen, and their rage caused them to lash out and kill him. When you rage, you lash out and hurt the thing that's making you angry. And that's the problem. We say, what's making you angry? You usually say, something is making you angry. You stop seeing the person that's making you upset as a person, and you see them as a thing. They stop being a brother and sister. Instead, they become the object of your rage, the thing that is making you upset. They're no longer Carl, your co-worker, who doesn't fill the paperwork out right, and he becomes that person over there two cubicles away. They stop becoming Jill, a friend, and become that jerk down the street who borrowed your lawnmower and didn't return it with a full gas tank. They stop becoming a person, and they become an it. I know many of us will say, well, I would never do that. I, I don't get angry. I keep it under control. But friends, I know we like to see ourselves nice and kind people, and we are, for the most part, nice and kind people. We love our neighbors as we love ourselves. At least we do the best we can, and we're all good. But if you want to see rage in action, drive in traffic. Drive in traffic sometime. Maybe we're not flipping the bird. Maybe we're not brake checking the guy in front behind us. But when the driver in the SUV cuts us off in the last moment, we'll probably grumble and say a few choice words under our breaths, question their competency and their intelligence of the sedan driving too slowly. We can get angry at them. We can rage at them because we don't know them. To us, they're just a car. I'm not angry at the driver. I'm angry at that core in front of me who's doing 30 in a 50, and I have places to be. That was yesterday. (laughs) Don't even get me started on the internet when we can rage at people because we don't see them as people. We see them as their posts online. None of us are perfect friends. We know this. We're all flawed. We're all called to be working towards perfection with God's help. And every day, with every step we take, walking with Christ, we are inching our way towards perfection. And one of the most important steps, one that we need to always be praying for, is that the Spirit opens our eyes and sees others as they truly are. 
not a thing, not an enemy or a them, not a stranger, but someone that God made. That they're made in God's image, just as you are. That they're loved by God, just as you are. That God loved them so much, Jesus was sent for them too. That no matter how slow they drive, or how many times they borrow your tools and don't return them, that no matter how annoying they can be, they are your neighbors. And you're not to get angry with them because rage makes you forget all that. Rage makes you forget the truth. So show them love. Show them patience. Show them kindness and gentleness and self-control. Show them the opposite of rage. Show them peace. Peace. That's the answer I gave to that third grader all those, about three years or so ago. And honestly, I was pretty proud of it. It was a good answer. I thought it was well-formed. And then God showed me I should never get too cocky. Because that kid proceeded to ask, but didn't Jesus get angry and flip some tables one time? Oh, have you ever been schooled by a third grader? <laughs> it doesn't feel great. And I could have lied. I could have said, well, Jesus, it doesn't say Jesus got angry. But friends, I've watched enough wrestling to know you don't flip a table because you're the semblance of calm order. So is it okay to get angry then? If Jesus got angry and flipped the table, and God is sometimes described as getting angry, it is it okay to get angry? The men who stoned Stephen were angry. They raged. That's a sin. They gnashed their teeth and all that. But as you read the story of Stephen, read chapters 6, through the end here, you realize Stephen was angry too. But his anger wasn't rage. His anger was something different. So, who was Stephen anyway? He kind of just comes on the scene and he's stoned and that's it. He's not one of the 12. He is not even one of the replacements for, of the 12, like Matthias, who you probably all just realized, oh yeah, Matthias is a person in the Bible, right? No, Stephen was chosen to be an apostle because he got angry. See, the Jewish religious authorities had a duty to care for widows. It's one of the most important jobs they had. But instead, they started taking economic advantage of widows. You know, buy their houses. Be Scrooge. Not good. So the early church stepped in. The early church, led by the 12 apostles, by Peter, James, and John, stepped in, and this is the time where they're still sh pulling all their resources together, and they help. They help the widows. They help and made sure the widows had what they needed, except for maybe by accident, maybe by design, they didn't help the Greek-speaking widows. The Greek-speaking widows, you know, the outsiders, the ones that aren't from Judea who came later. They don't speak the language. They're immigrants. They're a them. They are not part of the charity. And that made Stephen angry. And he came to the church, he called them out and said, why are you not taking care of these widows like you ought to? And the church listened and said, we are so sorry. Stephen, you're in charge of this now. Make sure everyone gets what they need. Even in his speech before his martyrdom, Stephen gets angry. 
Read it sometimes. It sounds pretty angry. Stephen goes through all the times that the Hebrews have been an other, have been a them, have been an outsider. And what he's doing is he's calling out the religious authorities saying, I'm a Greek speaker, Our people, my people are Greek speakers, and you treat us like outsiders, like we're unwanted and unloved, but you have been treated just the same way. He calls them out for ignoring the widows, the orphans, and the aliens. That they were stiff-necked and they ignored the Spirit of God calling them. He was angry. But Stephen's anger wasn't at someone. He wasn't angry at the men before him. In fact, he prayed for God to forgive them because he loved them. He was angry at the injustices he saw. He was angry at the system that supported it all. He he wasn't enraged to the point that he saw people's things. Instead, he loved them even more because he was angry. See, anger turned against people becomes rage. Anger turned against injustices becomes zeal. Zeal, Uh, fancy word, means the energy to pursue a goal. That's what Stephen did. Anger that becomes rage is destructive. It's aimed at people and tears them down and causes harm, but zeal energizes to pursue a cause. Zeal sees an injustice and seeks it to make it right. Zeal doesn't destroy, zeal heals. Zeal doesn't bring pain, it brings hope and justice. Zeal isn't born from hurt. It isn't born from rage. Zeal is born from love. Zealous, zeal is what made Jesus flip a table. Because he looks at his father's house and sees it turned into a shopping mall. So he had zeal and he flipped the table and drove them out. God sees his people time and time again making the same mistakes. And he's not angry with them. He's angry at their sin. And he has zeal to bring them home to make things right. God sees injustice and brings justice. And we're called to do the same. We are called by the Spirit to have zeal. For it's with zeal that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. For friends, the truth is, when we see our brothers and sisters being mistreated, when we see others being despised and hated, when we see people hurt, we should be angry. But not the people involved, but the reasons why it's happening. We should be angry at the events that led up to it, for the systems that support it. And then we're called by God to stand up and do something about it. That is zeal. Because here's the secret, friends. We're called to love our brothers and sisters, our neighbors as we love ourselves. And to do that, we show love to Christ too. And part of that love is zeal. So friends, if you have a coworker you see being stepped on by your bosses, it's okay to get zealous and help them. It's okay to be half zealous and do something when you see a wrong. Maybe you have zeal over the fact that someone is sick and they're alone. And you think, how could they be left alone in this time? So you have the zeal to go out and do something about it. You spend time with them. You call others to come in. You get them a prayer blanket. 
Or you hear someone doesn't have enough money to put food on the table, or they're eating ramen for the fifth day straight, and you are thinking, how is this possible? How can we live in a world where this is allowed? And you do something about it. You donate to our food pantry. Donate to any food pantry. Donate with charity. Friends, love is a call to action. And part of that action is having zeal. That's why I should have said to that third grader after they schooled me with their question, but instead I went, hmm, good question, next. See, I learned something. It's not impossible, Rita. (laughs) I can be taught. So friends, I just leave you with this message today. Don't let rage consume you. Don't let rage make you sin against your neighbors because rage causes you to see them not as your neighbors, but as a thing in your way. But friends, also, don't ignore when you see harm being done. Don't ignore the suffering of others. Don't ignore the cries of the needy. Instead, have zeal for it. Have the energy and drive to ask God, what do you want me to do? Have the trust in the Spirit to follow the Spirit into action. Because friends, God loves us, always. And when we sin, when we make mistakes, God has zeal for us. Not angry at us, angry at our mistakes, and calling us home. So friends, have zeal today. Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able in body and spirit for our closing hymn, Because He Lives.
Friends, before you go from here and have a restful Sabbath, until we see each other again, receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his kindness upon you. And I pray for you this, that God may give you peace. Amen.